Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marie-Pierre Béarnais. I am a high altitude mountaineer and I scale the highest peaks of our planet. I'm also an advocate for gender equality. In fact, I made it my mission to elevate the female footprint on the world's highest or most challenging peaks. And that is to encourage women to pursue their highest goals, whether literally or figuratively. I often say it, climbing a mountain, and especially an 8,000 meter peak, it's a full-on continuous process of dynamic risk assessment. And I know a thing or two about that, being an expert in risk management and resilience, a field I am most passionate about. I am pretty sure it has a lot to do with the fact that I survived one of the biggest natural disasters of all time, the 2004 tsunami in Southeast Asia. Severely traumatized at the age of barely 19, I battled a PTSD, but also the survivor guilt syndrome, which basically felt like I was carrying a huge weight on my shoulders and thinking that if I would not succeed in making my life worthy of surviving by having an impact on the world, that I might as well have died that day. My very own path to personal resilience was a mountain of its own, a long and very hard route fraught with pitfalls. But today, thanks to the real tangible mountains of the world, I am a stronger version of myself. Today, more than just a hobby or an increasingly growing area of my professional life, the mountains have taken all this space, becoming even so much more than a lifestyle. Some would argue that climbing mountains isn't of much use. Well, they could not be further away from the truth. Climbing mountains changes the world because it changes you. I started getting into the mountains about seven years ago. I had just watched the movie Everest, a movie based on the 1996 tragedy. Beyond the horror of it all, I think that movie just truly opened me up to this idea of just how much discomfort and pain some people were willing to endure to pursue a goal that seemed so far-fetched. I was fascinated. A couple of months later, I flew to Nepal to go and trek the Everest Base Camp Trail, a 65-kilometer trek after which I would eventually get to the spot where mountaineers set up their tent at the base of Everest. The landscapes were incredible, the energy unreal. I was swept off my feet. When I arrived at my target and could finally see Everest, or Sagar Mata, as the Nepali call it, meaning the goddess of the sky, I looked at her in awe. Not only I knew I wanted to spend more time in the mountains, but I wanted more. So I told myself, one day, I'm going to stand on top of the world. <laughs> Full transparency. It probably started off as an egotistical endeavor because I was not yet a true mountain lover back then. But oh boy, mountains have a way with ego. And I got mine crushed more than once. And so there I was, daydreaming of cementing the roof of the world but I had zero knowledge nor competencies related to mountaineering whatsoever. I had never even put on a pair of crampons. I was 30 years old already. Surely my parents should have put me up to climbing as a kid or at least as a teenager so I would at least have a few skills up my sleeves, no? Or maybe it wasn't too late after all to reinvent myself and chase this bold undertaking. Maybe, just maybe, there is always space and time to become another version of ourselves. The rest was a whirlwind. Nepal changed my life, really. It's people, it's mountains. What a unique, precious, and powerful place. Every holiday from work after that was spent, was dedicated to spending more time in the mountains. And so this is how I found myself a few months later on the highest peak of Africa, Kilimanjaro. After Nepal, I felt like a superwoman for having succeeded a fairly challenging high altitude trek as a beginner. So 
I plan to hike Kili in just three days. That was an extremely bad idea. I had heard about acute mountain sickness, AMS, but didn't really think much of it, especially that my experience in Nepal had been so smooth because I took it slow. So there, on Kili, on the night of the summit push, I quickly started acting irrationally, my peripheral vision getting narrower until I could barely see. I was vomiting every few minutes. I was staggering. My head was pounding. I was not good. Mission aborted. I took it hard. It wasn't a good start. Mount Everest seemed even more out of reach. So I went back a second time, better prepared, more informed, took my time, listened to myself, and I focused on, on the process rather than on the outcome so much. And ironically, well, that led to achieving my goal, but also to a much more enjoyable venture. And so getting discouraged in the face of a setback was definitely not an option. And forget about the word failure. In fact, I think it should be taken out of our language, plain and simple. Why? Well, because setbacks play a vital role in getting us better equipped for the attainment of later goals and greater goals, which often wouldn't have even been remotely possible from the, without the, the learnings from these previous mishaps. I often think about what might have been if that Kili incident had occurred on a higher or more technical peak. Well, perhaps I would not be standing here today to reflect on lessons learned. That setback was far from a failure, but had everything to do with learning, growing, and getting me ready for what was coming next. I find that we're often quick to beat ourselves up. We lack kindness towards ourselves. We want answers right away as to why things happened the way they did. But in the grand scheme of things, and with a bit of patience, or sometimes with a lot of patience, we almost always realize that life had a bigger plan for us. It's then about, well, staying committed, positive, confident, seek the right resources, the right help, from the right people, preferably before, but hey, worst case, it's about accepting that we're allowed to make mistakes, that it's normal to make mistakes, especially when embarking on the journey of learning a new skill. The key? Well, it's the start, to take that first step and the rest will follow. After Kili, I, um, I started true technical climbing seeking higher grounds and more and more challenging peaks on every continent of the world. And then my target kept moving steadily upwards towards the very highest mountains of the world, the 8,000ers, those rising above the unforgiving dead zone. There are 14 mountains higher than 8,000 8, meters. They're all located in Nepal, China, and Pakistan. In the dead zone, only 30% of the normal quantity of oxygen gets into our lungs because of a much lower barometric pressure. And so the human body start, starts to die. Altitude is probably the most consistently difficult challenge of a high altitude climb, and it spares no one. We acclimatize by going higher at a measured pace, and so this shocks the body into producing more red blood cells, but that is a slow process, and we have to do it carefully. That is why climbing a high mountain takes so much time. A person going directly at high altitude without any prior acclimatization could very well suffer from pulmonary or cerebral edema, and the consequences can be fatal. Climbing Everest was um, an extremely difficult uh, expedition, both physically and mentally, especially that I had set my target on a speed world record from the summit of Everest to the summit of Lhotse. 
Lhotse is the neighbor of Everest and is the fourth highest mountain in the world. And so what my project entailed specifically was summiting Everest, start the timer, run down to Camp 4 on South Col, traverse to Lhotse and reach its summit, all of this in a record time. That did not happen. Not that I wasn't fast, I was unstoppable. Prakash and Mi'kmaq shared my excitement as well, but as we were ascending the Lhotse face towards the summit, only a couple, hour, a couple of hours after I summited Everest, things got complicated. There had been loads of snow falling down on us that season due to two cyclones back to back, and so the avalanche danger was full on. I started receiving calls on the radio from the rest of my team who were still up high on Everest descending with a view on a Lhotse face to warn us that um, an avalanche crack was starting to form higher up. So it's the whole Lhotse face that could very well slide down with us on it. I turned around, sad. I had just summited Everest. It was five years that I had been dreaming about it and working towards it but I was overwhelmed with disappointment. So looking ahead and upward was the only way, and so I did, towards an even bigger challenge, the second highest mountain in the world, K2 in Pakistan. There she is, absolutely magnificent. My soul had been set on K2 for a while now, but she was one of the deadliest at the time, killing about 30% of mountaineers setting foot on it. She was also said to have a curse on women because all first five women who summited K2 were all killed shortly after in the Himalayas. With steep slopes, K2 is literally a pyramid of uh, rock, snow, and ice. Blue ice towards the top, which makes it difficult even for the very tip of our crampons to dig in and hold. One wrong move, you fall, and good luck trying to stop your fall. To that point, descending K2 was absolutely terrifying. I was bombarded by rocks falling from higher up, rocks kicked by climbers descending above, and these rocks would fall at such speed that they would smash and burst into many explosions of smoke and powder. At one point, I got hit by multiple rocks at the same time, and I panicked. I thought to myself, my God, Marie, you just summited K2, but you're going to die on the way down? There, on K2, I fully, fully grasped this idea that it isn't entirely up to me only or my team to be able to reach the summit and get back down safely. The mountain decides. Climbing K2 was um, spiritual, humbling, and truly transformative. The mountains, well, they're like a mirror for the soul. You can't lie to them, nor to yourself while in their surroundings. You can try, but very quickly your true nature will come out, because this is what they do. The mountains force us to grow. They show us what matters. They remind us of how fragile and small we are, but yet of how much we can accomplish together as a team when we climb them. In them, you connect to others in deeper ways, yet you also connect with your true self, but yet again to a force that's bigger than all of us. The mountains, they don't care where you're from your age, your gender, how much money you have, everyone is on the same level. Mountaineering is my religion. I climb to connect to the world, to myself, to others, but I also climb to transform, be empowered, and become a better version of myself. You know, after a tough climb for which you have been eyeing the objective for months, after you gave it all you have, Every other challenge of your daily life will take a different color. Next week's report, that presentation to senior management, that conference on a stage in front of hundreds of people, they will all seem so much more within reach. Often, our routine or our comfortable lifestyle gets in the way of our full potential, of becoming more accomplished human beings. We get lazy, 
complacent, but discomfort is a powerful tool for getting us closer to our true self, our true potential. So I say go. Go find something that you love, something that will get you out of your comfort zone, something that will truly allow you to understand what you are made of, who you are. You will be surprised of how much more we are capable of. We are strong. We are resilient. We are powerful, just like the mountains. We are mountains. Thank you.